here. So um, thank you all for getting on with us today for our overall orientation of the dog project for Colorado. There was the, we've just been working really hard on updating a lot of things with the state dog committee. And if there were questions, things like that, we just kind of wanted to give you all an opportunity to see what we've been doing, um, to be aware of the changes that have happened in the rules and things like that, and then show you some of the awesome new resources that the committee has developed. So with that, I will go ahead and start our um, presentation here. So let me get that up and going. Sorry, it takes a moment to get the screen the way I want it to be. All right, Kirsten, you're in my little box here. Can can you see the presentation? Yes, okay, perfect. So thank you. And um, you all can always unmute or type in the chat as we go along and have questions because we expect you all to have questions and things like that. So we have plenty of time during the presentation and then after as well. So don't feel like you're pressured um, to wait till the very end to ask your questions just because we do have quite a few things to uh, cover today. So very first off, um, again, just a big welcome and thank you. So this is kind of a brief overview of our state dog committee. Um, we are encouraging people to join up. So if you are um, a leader or an agent or a coordinator, basically if you just have dog project responsibilities in your county and you would like to add a voice to the state committee, um, we'd be more than happy to help you because we do have a bit of a smaller group. So you can either email um, my co-host, Kirsten Cohen, who is there in Douglas County, or myself. Um, I am Beth Delaire here in Pueblo County, and um, we'll get you settled in on the committee if you'd like to join us. And then we do have our keynote speakers that will be talking on a couple different items today. We have Carol Coons. Um, many of you probably heard of her. She's from Pueblo County. She's now a leader. We have um, Anne. I'm not, I can't ever say her last name, so I'm not really going to try so I don't murder it, but she's a Boulder County leader. We have Brenda on here who's in Douglas County with Kirsten. Um, Dennis, he's an AKC judge. He's been a 4-H judge. We use him all the time for so much of his expertise. And then we have Brian who is the El Paso leader and he also is our agility superintendent for the state of Colorado for 4-H. So that's kind of who we have on here. Here. Um, there's other people on the committee that aren't on this call, uh, but these are kind of the experienced keynote speakers we really want you all to meet. And then, of course, if you ever have questions about anything, these would be the great people to contact because they could really answer your questions because they have so much knowledge and experience with this project on both a county level and a state level. So with that, this kind of shows you what we're going to be going over today. Um, as you all might have noticed, if you saw the rules that Joey had sent out, um, there has been some revisions in there. We've created state placement flowcharts. We have a dog spreadsheet template we're going to show you all. There's new study guides this year coming out for the test soon. Um, there's been that change in the hopefully in fair entry for the $25 per exhibitor for state dog, not per division. So even if your youth is doing only agility, they should only still pay that $25. They wouldn't have to um, do extra amounts if they were gonna do agility and like obedience or rally or anything like that. And then the other big thing we kind of wanted to just make everyone aware is that for the 2022 dates, it will most likely be a bit before state fair. It will share that same weekend as the state shooting sports competition versus this year, it will be during state fair. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you kind of look ahead for your calendar planning, just because we know that you all kind of like to be a year ahead. So just things to keep in mind as uh, we move forward. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our um, Agility Superintendent, Mr. Brian. And uh, Brian, I'll give you the floor and I'm here to kind of watch the chat and so is Ms. Kirsten and we'll answer questions as we go along. So that's great because uh, I have this little tiny laptop screen now. I don't have a chat up somewhere else I can see. So perfect. Um, so my name is Brasty and I've been involved with uh, 4-H in both shooting sports and dogs for several years now. Um, right now my focus is on uh, dog agility for the dog firm. Um, my daughter is heavily into dog agility. She's aged out of 4-H now, but uh, she competes in AKC um, agility events. Um, we're actually in Douglas County right now doing that. So the, the key things that I really wanted to talk about and get out is we've had trials for a couple of years at the state level. We hold them in El Paso County. It looks like we might have lost Brian there. 
for a moment. Yep, it looks like he might have lost connection. So we'll give him a moment to get back on. As you all are aware, sometimes Zoom does not always work in, work in your favor, but um, I'm sure we're having tech issues in the background that are running on this issue, so we will get him back online. But um, as, as Brian was talking about, he has a wealth of knowledge and agility. Their whole family competes in it um, with him, him, his wife, and his daughter. Um, and they are going to go over all the things you see here. The biggest thing is that date for this year. That is the 2021 date, that's September 18th and the, and the 19th at the El Paso County Fairgrounds in Callahan. So please do let your youth know that is a separate event from the State Fair Obedience Rally and Showmanship Divisions, which will be on August 28th and 29th. So, and those will be at the Colorado State Fairgrounds down in Pueblo. Um, so just some key, key differences there between all of that. Um, and we'll give him another moment or two to try and get back on here. Because I know sometimes it's just you just get kicked off right when you, it's going really well. In the meantime, does anyone have any like burning questions while we're waiting for him to get back on? I know we like literally just kicked it off, but I don't know if you have any questions for us before we get further along here. It doesn't sound like it. Okay. So for now, if it looks like Brian, um, we will come back to him once he's back on. So we will come back to this once he's back. So we'll just keep going forward so we're um, aware of time crunch for everyone. So with that, we are going to go ahead to our next thing here, which is our levels, classes, and flow charts uh, with Carol and Kirsten. So I'll hand it over to Kirsten so she can talk about this slide and then she will be showing you um, those specific flow charts and she and Carol will walk you through those. So Kirsten, the, the floor is yours. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to kick it off and then um, bring Carol into the loop. But basically, I don't want to say we didn't make changes this year to the rule book, but a lot of the yellow highlights you see is just us trying to clarify, trying to make things a little easier to understand if you have a new parent that's stepping up as a leader or you have a new agent in your county, a new dog superintendent, trying to just make things make sense. So it's easy to look at the rules and see where your youth and dog should be. Um, however, we also recognize that looking at that giant rule book, because the dog rule book is still big, um, another way of seeing that information would be helpful. So we made um, flow charts, which I'll share screens once I'm done with this slide. That should be helpful. It's still a lot of text, but it should help you decide, you know, where your youth and dog have competed what they did at that level, either at your county or at state fair, and then where do they go next? What are the options? That way it just makes it a little easier because those of you who have been in dog for a little bit, you know we have the four disciplines. We have showmanship, obedience, rally, and agility. And within that, there's a bunch of different classes and divisions and it can get confusing. So we hope this really helps and a few of our volunteers and especially came up with a few different like scenario questions that we can go over about if your youth is this age and has done this, what class would they go in? So we can kind of play that towards the end if people want to play questions. Um, it's We called it a game of like trying to figure out where they would all fit in. So it just should help make things a little less complicated, hopefully. And we would love your feedback if we did not achieve that so we could keep working on it. Um, just know that this is set up to be a generalized flow chart for the state level and each county might be a little different. Um, which I know was interesting, even just on our committee talking about, you know, how Douglas might be different than Pueblo, might be different than Boulder, but everything funnels up to the state level. So know that those are in there and that's okay. Um, and the really big thing is just knowing what qualifies your kid to go to state fair if that's their goal. Um, last thing on this slide is puppy class, especially. We don't offer it at the state level right now, but we really encourage it to be offered at the county level. I think it's a really fun introductory way to get those younger dogs or unexperienced dogs to have some show experience. And then the master's class is also something that came up in our conversation. It might look really different at your county versus state fair. So at state fair, you know, ignoring our COVID year last year, we have the three showmanship judges. It's a really big deal. It takes a while and it's really awesome for those kids who have gotten there. But that's not really 
easy or convenient or logistically possible for counties to do, especially if the county only has a few kids in the dog program. Um, so it might look a little different and that's okay. And we'll talk you through how to make sure the kids can still qualify for state fair if that's their end goal. So before I dive into the flow chart, Carol, do you have anything to say about levels, classes, and how to figure that information out? Uh-oh. Carol, we can't hear you. You are unmuted on our side. But if you are talking, we cannot hear you. It looks like she's trying to fix you. Okay. Not a problem. So okay, while we're doing there we go. We hear you now. Okay. The easiest one to look at first is showmanship because showmanship is based only on age. So if you have new kiddos, eight to 10, they will go in the novice. If you have kiddos from 11 to 13, they go in the intermediate. If you have kiddos that are 14 and above, they go in the senior. Now, if the kids, uh, and they have to move to those different classes until they age out. So uh, for example, the junior uh, division, first year kiddo, goes in junior novice. And then the next year, they cannot stay in that. They have to go to junior open. So they stay in that class until they age out. So they stay there until they're intermediate 11 years old. Then those kids who have experience go into intermediate open. So they jump down and go to intermediate open. The novice classes are for kiddos only in their first year. So if you've got a brand new 11 year old coming in or 11 to 13, they go in the novice class, jump into the open class. And then this is the one that has an advanced class. So they can go in open or if you feel the trainer is confident that that kiddo can go to advance, they can jump to advance, but no, they can't go back once they go in there. So they're in intermediate open. I would suggest moving kids to intermediate open before you move them to intermediate advance. Then if they get that qualifying score, then they can move to intermediate advanced. And then the same with seniors when they are uh, first year kiddos. Uh, and there's not very many of these that come in. Um, they are, they go into senior novice. So very first year kiddo, 14 to 18 goes in novice, no matter you know, what it is. Uh, then they move to senior open and then they move to senior advanced. And I, I would suggest doing that unless you have a kid that, you know, shows in AKC, shows someplace else, uh, and you feel after their first year, they can move to senior advanced. Then we have the master's class. And this is open for intermediates and seniors. So let me give you an example of a, a kiddo in our county. She was 11 years old when she went into the master's division. She won the master's division. So she has to stay in there the remainder of her 4-H career in showmanship, unless she gets a new dog. If she gets a new dog, then they can move back to senior advanced, but that's only with a brand new dog, okay? Any questions on showmanship? I'm trying to highlight what you're talking about, Carol, as you're talking. Hopefully it's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Um, do we just wanna note that because of COVID last year, our novice kiddos were not able to come to show. So they are able to remain at novice this year. They might just have to switch. Right their age if they've aged up to a division, a different age division. 
Yeah, and that was only for because of COVID last year. So that's that's the one exception. If you have a kiddo that uh, was in intermediate novice and they did not qualify, because we did have state fair last year, but if they didn't qualify, if they didn't go to state fair, then they can stay in that class for this year. Any questions? Oh, and the only other thing, sorry, it's another um, COVID adaption is in a typical year, and Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, youth who earn first through 10th at state fair have to move up to that advance. Yeah. They have that qualifying score, but last year for 2020, because of COVID, it was just those youth first through fifth. Right. Right. Okay. So there's some fun COVID rules that are trickling into our dog show rules as well. Yeah, they are. Yeah, because we didn't place the kids first through 10th last year, mainly because there was, in some of the classes, not even 10 kids in that class. So uh, we just placed them first through fifth. Okay. I shall in. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, and Carol, if you don't see the chat, Shay says hi. Yeah. All right. So that is showmanship. Where do you want to go to next, Carol? That I don't know a lot about rally. So I think I'm going to let Ann talk about rally. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not versed in rally very well. Um, not a problem. And like you said, the puppy division, that's for... I'll give you an example. We have a kiddo that has a Doberman Pinscher. He's a very, very tiny little boy, and he's trying his darndest to, to show in beginner novice, but the dog is a little aggressive if the dad is not there. <clears throat> not only they can't touch the dog from the neck down, so we're recommending that kiddo just to go into the puppy class for this year. So if you have any of those dogs that are not experienced, you know, you don't feel that they, if they've been practicing in novice A and you don't think that they can uh, make it in that class, I would move them back to the puppy class. And I know there's a lot of questions about the age of the dog in the puppy class. Um, and what, what I've recommended, and I don't see it here that we've even put an age in here again. Um, but I always say under 18 months, but. Well, I'm gonna jump in. This is Brenda. We didn't put an age in there for those individuals whose families have adopted a dog and maybe the dog has right. no training whatsoever. So that's why there is no age limit on it this year. Yeah, yeah. For so those if, of you who speak horse. Dogs. Think of that green 10 year old quarter horse. It still happens, even though they're a little older, they still might not be trained. So those older dogs that they're just adopting that doesn't have a lot of basic experience or basic obedience, they could still qualify for puppy class. Yeah, so is, this, real, is, is this new? I know the puppy class um, has been around for a while and we just haven't adopted it in our county. And maybe that's why I didn't read it close enough to realize that it's not just for you know, puppies under a certain age, but is the intention of it, has it always been this for those? Um, okay, all right. It just wasn't clear. And there was yeah. always a lot of questions. So we okay. tried to clean Thank it you. up a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so if you've got a kiddo that is in beginner novice A and the trainer or you as the agent are there watching that kid and you don't think, that it's feasible for them to show in that, I would certainly move them back to the puppy class. And that adopting a dog with no training is a really good example. Okay, kids that are in beginner, novice A are kids who first year obedience, very first year. And everything, <clears throat> excuse me, on that, uh, in that class is on lead. There's nothing off lead. The one thing that you need to have in your county is the signs for the beginner novice classes, whether it be A, B, C1, or C2. There are definitely 
signs that you put up in the ring for that class. So uh, I just went on J&J Dog Supplies yesterday, and they do sell, sell that, just that small pack of cards for those four classes. So our kiddos in, in beginner novice A first year, uh, then they can move to beginner novice B. And this is a new rule on the state that if they don't get a qualifying score, if they don't get a qualifying score at county, they don't get a qualifying score at state, they can stay in that class. That's correct, right, Brenda? If they don't get a, if they can move to beginner novice B, whether they have a qualifying score or not. That's correct. Right. Okay. Uh, and the uh, reason is, for the, just for those that know, the reason is because beginner novice A and beginner novice B have two separate types of exercises. And so beginner novice A is all on leash. Beginner novice B is part on leash, part off leash. Right. Okay, beginner novice C1 is for kiddos who get a new dog. Say they've been in A and B and something happens to their dog, they get a brand new dog, or they just don't like that dog in obedience. They can, um, they can show in C1. And then they, the same applies, the same as beginner A, beginner B, they move on to C2. Okay, say they get a qualifying score um, at State Fair in uh, C1. And did we move them to novice then? No, it's the same thing as C1 is the same thing as A. It's just the qualifications of okay. those classes are different. So whatever happens in okay. the novice A is the same as C1, except for the experience of the dog uh, handler or the experience of the dog itself. Right. And they can stay in that class until they get a qualifying score. Okay, Correct. novice A and B is people get that, the agents get that really mixed up because we have beginner novice A, and sometimes people just say novice A. They forget that word beginner. And so this is a totally different class. This is off lead novice A after the kiddo's been through whatever classes they need in the beginner, then they move to novice A, their first year in novice A. And the same, same thing applies here. Uh, if they get that, that score, then they move to novice B. Okay. Um, if they got qualifying scores, then they moved up to the next division. You're correct. So, yeah, so she like misspoke if, there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So novice A, if yeah, you get a qualifying score, yeah, you go to the pre grad novice A. But if you didn't qualify, you stay in that set of exercise classes, novice B until you get your qualifying score. Perfect. County or state. Thank you. Right. Right. <clears throat> and then pre-grad novice uh, A is for those kids that <clears throat> jumped up into that class. Really, it's about the same in every level. They have an A and a B. Um, level and if they qualify then they jump up to the next division which the divisions that we have are beginner novice novice pre-grad grad and advanced so it, it, the the repetition is just about the same in every single class as the dogs progress if they don't progress then they stay where they are until they get that qualifying score. Then they have to move up. Does that make sense? Yes. And then when you get up to open and open B, those are the advanced classes and utility. Uh, that's a very advanced class. I've, I've not had maybe one or two kiddos. Um, in all the years I did it, move up to utility A and B. I think one was from Douglas County, as I think. 
And then we have the veterans division. These are dogs who are older. And, um, you know, say you have a seven year old dog and he can't compete anymore because of arthritis or any other medical problems. You could move them into the veterans division. The one thing about the veterans division, let's say that dog goes into that division. They can't jump back and go back where they were say they something's wrong with them you move them to the uh, novice uh, the veterans division and then they they can't jump back if the dog gets well they can't jump back into that other division where they were and there's several classes in the veterans division so you'll just have to look in the rules and see where they go and say that you have a, you move a dog that's been in open and he's really old, and but you still want to show him and you move him in, um, they will show in the novice division probably first. Uh, and there is a jump height reduction. If there's a jump in the ring, there's a jump height reduction for those older dogs. Any questions on that? This is pretty clear to help you um, move through the, um, the different classes. I'm gonna turn it over to somebody else for rally because I don't know a lot about rally. Oh, that's okay. And I have a few things to say, and I know it still doesn't look clear. You guys are probably like, what are you still talking about? Once you start placing kids a few times, it starts to make a lot more sense. And just some caveats down here um, for obedience is we use terminology like qualifying at the county level. Um, and that might be different. You might allow in your county a qualifying just at state fair, or your county might count a qualifying score for a 4-H fund match. So that'll be up for your county. Um, and then other things to think about in obedience is, what was I gonna say? It's Friday. Um, members that have titles. So your members that are showing dogs outside of 4-H, if they get titled at the level more than four months before state dog trials, um, they're disqualified to compete at that level. So that's far enough away that they have time to switch gears and train at that next higher level. Um, whereas if they get titled closer, so closer to state fair, say it was only a month out, they're showing and they get their title, they can still stay at that level is the caveat we have there. Um, and again, for 2021, exhibitors have the option to repeat the obedience class that they did in 2020 because last year was tough. Right. Um, and if Thanks. No problem, Carol. We're actually going to switch gears again because Brian is back with us. So I want to make sure that we Hello. get to talk about agility and then we'll come back to rally um, and Anne can talk to us about that. So can you take back over the screen, Beth, or do you want me just to go to the agility place chart? Um, if, yeah, if you'll, let's see, I'll stop, we'll stop sharing and we will go back to his slide so he can talk about that. Perfect. Uh, we'll probably, I'm sure he'll probably want to chat with everyone about the, the placement chart so they can all see the agility one as well. So let me go back here. Okay, Brian, if you want to try and unmute on your phone now and hopefully we should be able to hear you and keep you on the Zoom with us, we'll give it back to you. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Sir. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so can somebody like tell me where I got dropped off? I'm sure I didn't see it right away. <laughs> um, you were just telling the group a little bit about yourself and like um, Sabrina's involvement with uh, agility and everything like that. So that's kind of where we were and then we lost you. So if you want to start from the beginning, okay. that's, that's totally fine. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll consider the intro done and uh, I, I apologize. Apparently my uh, mobile phone's internet isn't adequate for a Zoom call. Um, so, yeah, so some of the things we wanted to talk about and make sure that everybody understood about our state agility program, um, you know, it's been going for a couple of years, but we've not been very, um, 
very strict about enforcing some of the rules that we have. Um, this year, we really want to start um, making sure um, dog heights are correct. And uh, there's a form that we have out there. We've had it all along um, that's supposed to be signed by a trainer and a vet, basically just saying that the dog is, you know, physically capable of, of doing the agility and the trainer's part of it is to say that the dog understands, you know, what the dog walk is or what the A-frame is and he's not going to get out there and just freak out on it and jump off and break a leg or something. Um, so, I mean, this year we're going to really try and, you know, make sure we have those forms for all of the um, competitors. And uh, we will also be measuring all the dogs this year to get them the height card that we are requiring. Um, we will have people there who can do the measurements and issue the height cards. So that won't be an issue. Um, it, I just don't want it to be a surprise for everybody. Um, you know, other things, we've also um, have a healing pretest. Um, for the foundation level kids. The reason for this is because agility is entirely off leash. We want to make sure that the, the kids can recall their dogs or keep basic focus of the dogs. It's not, um, it's not an obedience um, healing pattern that we'll be doing, but we just want to make sure that there's a connection and control there um, because many of our venues don't have um, good containment fencing for dogs. You know, like at El Paso County, when we do the state trial, um, it's cattle or horse uh, panels. Dogs can go under them or through them. Um, our, our trial is a separate event from the state fair show um, because we require a special venue and we really don't have time at state fair to get it in, let's see. And we hold it at El Paso County because that's, we can get our building, our facility down there for free. We don't have to charge extra to, to hold the event. So that is awesome. It's a little more out of the way, I know for some counties and I apologize, but we don't have to pay for it. So it's a great thing. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess that's really the highlights of what I wanted to go over. Um, and I'm definitely here and open for any questions anybody has. And while we're waiting for questions, Kirsten, if you want to take the screen back and just pull up that placement level for them so that people can see that. And then hopefully if anyone has questions or anything like that um, for Brian, now would be like a great time um, to ask them. And of course, uh, Brian, if you want to go through the flow chart that y'all put together, you certainly can if you would like to do that. Uh, um, I don't have it in front of me, so that's going to be really hard. No worries. Um, I have the flow chart that you guys have in El Paso up on the screen right now. And I think, at least from my, because I'm not an expert, my perspective on what you guys have been working on with agility is just stressing safety of the dogs and preparedness of the dogs before they're taking on these obstacles. And we know that not everyone has agility equipment. So if there's questions or comments or concerns to reach out earlier in the year and see what we can, what we can help with. But I guess my question, Brian, is everybody starts at the foundation level unless they have a title, am I correct? Yes. Yeah, that is the intent. Yeah. So you guys can see here, and there's two classes for agility. Hopefully I'm using that right. There's standard, and then there's the jumpers. And they progress similarly. Um, yeah, they progress identically. The, the jumpers just doesn't have your contact equipment in it okay. um, and has more jumps. Um, and yeah, you usually compete in both, not necessarily at the same level because dogs will usually progress through jumpers quicker. Um, I don't know about how that'll work in 4-H with the years. That may be different, but. 
the, All right. so we have the, any the, agility uh, questions? The only other thing that might be worth mentioning here is Brian, if you want to explain that um, addendum to the agility rules, and Kirsten, if you can switch screen mm -hmm. one, just because um, if you all, we had an addendum that came out a little bit after the, ori the original state rules did get posted regarding agility um, that had to do with like the requirements for for being able to get into it. Um, so while Kirsten's getting that pulled up. Brian, I don't know if you want to chat about that. That was that discussion about um, requiring like obedience or rally before uh, being able to be in agility is what I'm I'm referring to you since I know you probably can't probably. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was uh, basically we, we took out the requirement to be enrolled in the showmanship and the agility or in the uh, obedience to compete in agility. So um, kids can just come in and compete in just agility. Right, that was what we changed. Correct. As long as they're passing that basic. Um, yes, that healing test beginning is that crucial. One. Right. Kish, I believe it's a little. Sorry, I was like, what rule is it again? It's like that first one that we had. Um, it's there, right there, number one. Okay. Yeah, that was the one we were. Uh, going to amend it just it hasn't gotten there yet but just so that everyone's aware of that because um, we did have a leader bring that up and we discussed that at the state dog committee and realized that that was um, that made a lot of sense because there was a, a youth in a southern Colorado county that the dog only does agility um, and it does it really well however this dog does not do well in any other divisions it's kind of people aggressive it doesn't like being touched things like that so it just made it very difficult for this youth to meet this requirement. And uh, we didn't want to exclude anybody from being able to compete because we don't have that in the other divisions. You can be in just showmanship and you don't have to be in obedience or rally. So we kind of just wanted to recuperate that here in agility so that it was fair across the playing field for all the youth. So just something to keep in mind if you see that or you have leaders or youth who see that and kind of freak out a little bit about that, let them know. There is an amendment coming, um, and just that we're, we're aware of that on the state dog committee side of it, for sure. Um, and a big caveat with that, though, to let your members know is, and we will back the Christies on this, if you have dogs that travel even from practically another state and they can't pass that healing test, that it's not safe for them to compete, they're not going to be able to compete that day. And we know that's really hard, but the safety of the dogs and the kids are the most important thing. So we want to make sure that if they're not training in the other disciplines, that they do understand that they're going to have to pass that pretest, and that is a requirement, and to take that seriously. Is there a, a either a rubric or guideline on what that healing test looks like, so that our our trainers can work with the kids and everything to make sure that they hopefully can pass that? Um. No, there's not really. Uh, we kind of model it after the uh, healing pattern in obedience, but everything is up to the judge's discretion. If he feels that um, the dog can be recalled safely, then it's a pass. Um, and they're very re uh, lenient normally. I mean, like I said, really the big reason is we don't want the dogs running out of the ring, you know, and maybe going and attacking somebody or another dog. If they're not a perfect heel, I don't care. If they come back after they, you know, take 10 or 15 steps, that's still gonna be a pass. Okay. All right, so our trainers can look at that heel and that recall in obedience. I'm guessing an obedience level that's off leash is kind of the standard that they'd be working with the kids on. Yes, that's a good model. Perfect, thank you. All right, other questions about agility. And I know Brian threw out things like the height card, like the waiver that the vet and trainer sign, all of these other things. We're working with Joy to get one spot on the state website that will have the rules, the flow charts, everything you need. So it's gonna be a one-stop shop. And we don't know if that's gonna be like a one-page PDF link tree or if it's gonna be an entire website. And once we know that and Joy gets that set up, We'll make sure to share that. All 
All right, anything else with agility, guys? All right, Beth, do we want to switch gears back to rally now? Yeah, um, that'll work. Thanks so much, Brian, for, for sharing your insight. And of course, if any anyone on this call has questions about agility prior to the trials or anything, um, I know we can easily get you in touch with Brian. So feel free to contact either myself or Kirsten. Um, and of course, the presentation of this will be available and we can, you know, get the agility questions you may have um, to him in a timely manner. So um, just know that this is probably a lot to absorb, but we are here to help. And we have so much knowledge on the committee that we're, we're willing to spread it out if, if we can't figure out an answer for you rather quickly. All right, and last but not least, back to our rally class. And Anne, do you wanna share a little bit about this? Sure. Um, so I am Ann Janicki. I am the um, dog superintendent up here in Boulder County. And um, jumping back over here to the rally class placement, I think you'll find a lot of similarities between the structure of this and say the structure of um, the obedience classes. Um, the rally placement I think is a little bit easier. So if you look down, there are actually six divisions in rally, um, novice, intermediate are both on leash divisions. So these will be where your beginners are gonna enter into the system. Advanced, excellent. There's a combined class called Rally Advanced Excellent or RAE in shorthand. And then there's an optional class called Masters. So those are the six divisions in Rally. And then within each division, you will see that same A-level, B-level class as you saw in Obedience. And that's just for how you progress in terms of getting your qualifying scores. So when you have a brand new first year dog project member coming into the program. Um, those members are gonna start out at the rally novice A class level. This will be all on leash. They will be learning the rally signs from scratch. Um, there's uh, roughly 30, 35 signs that they're gonna learn that very first year. Um, a lot of them are very simple, some very simple turns left, right, speed variations, things like that. But that's, that's where they're going to start. Um, at the end of their first year, if they get a qualifying score in Rally Novice A at either the county level or the state dog trials, they will move up to the intermediate division. So they don't need to go to Rally Novice B, they go right to intermediate A. Okay, so the A classes are for dog and handler teams in their first year of that, of training in that division. So you can see here where it says rally intermediate training. So start out rally novice A, you get a qualifying score. Year two, you go to rally intermediate A. And that's the way you're gonna progress through the, the rally um, chart here for the most part. A couple things I'll call out for you. Um, if you have a member who is starting um, a new dog, if they get a puppy or, you know, similar to what the experience was in obedience there, if they just, their dog wasn't performing well in rally and they wanted to try a different dog, they would not be starting at the A level. They'll start at the novice B level here, the rally novice B level. Okay, because technically they do have some rally experience and it's their second or more year in rally novice training. Um, the other caveat to add here is as a superintendent or as a dog trainer in your county, um, if you feel these kids are proficient in the novice division or maybe the intermediate division, you know, you can go ahead and move them up. Once they've competed at that higher level, gotten a qualifying score, they cannot go back down. So I know I've had some kids that have been really proficient in the novice level and then are ready for off leash, you know, especially the, the kids that are starting new dogs and, and we've moved them around. So you do have that latitude and, and that flexibility to, um, to place your kids, you know, in the, in the appropriate class there, but just um, remember that you can't move them back down. Um, sliding up a little bit there. So you'll go each year through this progression, moving from division to division. Um, and then as you get higher here, you'll go to the advanced division. And this is where we start the off-leash um, exercises. So all of the 
um, classes or in, in the advanced division, excellent division, RAE division and masters, those are all performed off leash. Okay, so your, your kids do need to be proficient in that control and handling of their dog in order to move them to any of the advanced or higher classes. Um, the, uh, let's see here. So advanced division, you're gonna start off here. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. Um, all of the classes starting um, from the advanced division and higher will have jumps also involved in the, in the course. So advanced may have one jump, excellent might have two. And so you'll just kind of increase that difficulty as you go up. Um, and again, off leash handling. So um, when we get down to the RAE or the Rally Advanced Excellent Division, this particular division, if you're not familiar with this, requires two runs through a rally course. So the contestants at this level will need to complete and qualify in, a, in an advanced course and an excellent course at the same um, trial. So when you go to state fair or when you go to your county fair, they will actually have to have um, two qualifying scores in order to pass their level in RAE here. So that's what kind of sets that one aside. The other thing that, that sets this RAE division apart is that once kids have received a qualifying score in the A level, the RAE level, they will move to the B level and they can stay in B for the remainder of their um, time in um, 4-H or they have the option to move up to the rally master's level. And the master's level is an optional level um, for our 4-H members. So you get a qualifying score in RAEA, and then you know the member can decide whether they wanna go to B and stay there and work, continue to work with their dog on proficiency and some of the skills, or if they wanna move up to that master's division. Um, once they do go to master's, and show in that at that level, they cannot go back down to RAE. They have to stay in masters and then they'll just move to the masters B level. Thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> I'm having fun with arts and crafts. Over yeah, here. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a couple of the caveats there at the bottom there, um, some definitions as far as qualifying at the county level or um, the state level, whatever your county decides is the qualification requirement, you know, whether you're allowing fun match scores or not, um, you know, you do have that, that latitude there. Um, we also want to see the kids progress. Rally is a really fun sport for these kids. Um, you can talk, you can have fun with your dogs. Um, and so it's, it's always uh, good to move them up if they're showing that proficiency, you know, let them try the jumps and let them try some of the more complicated signs. It's really a fun, a fun time for them in the ring with the dog. Um, the same requirements apply with respect to AKC. I know a lot of, um, a lot of the members do um, show their dogs in AKC rally as well. If they um, do receive a title in one of the rally levels um, four months prior to state fair, they will need to move up to the next higher level for, for our 4-H for state fair. Um, so just keep that in mind. And I know it can be a little challenging to kind of figure out who's doing what, but um, it's always good to have that conversation with your kids at the beginning of the, the year. And, you know, maybe it's an honor system or whatever, um, but just let them know that if, if, you know, we find out that they do have a title that they, they would not be eligible, they would be disqualified from competing in that same level at State Fair. So just something to be aware of. Um, I think that's it for rally. I don't know if I missed anything. Anybody want to just pop a question? Yeah, and I, I was just going to tell the agents that are on that there's a special score sheet for RAE A oh. and B. So what you want to do is you pull that score sheet off and there's a column for the advanced, there's a col column for the excellent, and then how you score those kids is you add those two scores together and then that's their score. Anything in rally, any class that you have a tie, it's broken by the time. So the, right. the fastest time breaks the tie in rally. Right, good points. Um, I thought of one other thing too. Um, 
if if you've had the same rally equipment in your county for a while, you might want to double check it. AKC did update their signs. Um, I think it was, was it 2017 or 20, might have been 2017. Um, when they added the master's class. So the numbering may have changed. They did add a whole new set of signs for the intermediate um, level. So um, you might wanna just check your equipment and make sure you have the most current equipment. If you go on the AKC website under um, rally signs, there is a PDF file there with the current, it's uh, images of all the current signs and you can print that out in color and have those laminated and, and create your own set or you can go and purchase them from someplace like J&J &J Dog Supplies. So just a, just a reminder to check your inventory and make sure you have the, the current set of signs um, for rally. I think that's all I have. And did, did, they have a, did they have availability just to um, order those new master signs? Because I know we changed our numbers, you know, instead of ordering a brand new set, we just changed the numbers up in the corner of the oh yeah of I, the sign and added the masters in. So I I did change the numbering on some of our signs, but what I've been doing is um kind of a shortcut. But I take that PDF file and I only print the the you know the signs that I need. So if I only need the master signs, or maybe I need that extra set of beginner novice signs, I only print those pages from the PF, PDF and um, or take an image of it and just print them out and then I can kind of create my own homemade sets. Yeah, because there's a, there's a lot of signs. I know. <laughs> That's why rally so much fun though. It's so cool. Okay. And, and the um, other thing too is you can also find some rally maps on there if you need them to on the AKC site. They've got, they did virtual rally novice titles last year and they have a couple of different novice maps up there. So if you're looking for some course maps, you know, that's a really good little resource to find to go to that website. Awesome. And usually a judge will let you know, and at least in my experience, uh, if you hired them to do a rally course, they might send that rally course to you or ask them to send that to you once they get it done then you can print that out to, for the kids and they can pick up that, uh, that rally course and study it a little bit before they go in. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. All right. Does See, I did know a little bit about rally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, maybe there might be an opportunity at some point to do little mini workshops on, on running these rings or something. Um, just to kind of give little refreshers for your uh, county trainers, um, you know, and all the little details, because, you know, that to me is always the hardest part is like, how do I set this ring up? What do I do? <laughs> so it's all right. a lot. All right. Does anyone have any questions about the placement charts? So I think that wraps up all the levels in dog. All right. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and then Beth can get us back on track with our original PowerPoint. And I think we just have a few other things to show you guys. Sounds good. So, yeah. um, and I know that was probably a lot uh, for someone that, if you don't, if you've never really looked at any of that, um, but we did develop these with the help of the state committee just because we realized it can be really hard, especially when you have youth that get up in those higher levels and you're just kind of like, I don't really know where you fit in at this point, um, especially if you're in a new county and you're not you're not familiar with where the kids have been in the past and everything. That's kind of where we we hope a lot of this will be helpful to you. And then it's really helpful because it has those caveats for 2020 on there. If you had youth who competed at the 2020 state fair trials, that way you can know where does this youth belong because last year was such a weird year. So um, just lots of helpful helpful items on there that you'll be able to to use to your benefit. So moving back into our regular presentation here, um, I will get us back on our right slide. So um, again, this is what uh, Carol, Kirsten, um, Brian, and Anne were all kind of talking to you about here with our levels, classes, and flow charts. And then here um, 
it will be myself and Brenda that you heard talking as well during our placement charts. We're going to be talking to you about our dog project spreadsheet. So I'll tell you a little bit about it and then I'll show you what that looks like um, as the template that we did design. So we highly suggest if you're not doing this already, um, doing a Excel spreadsheet that keeps track of your youth and their dogs, their divisions and their scores on both the county level and the state fair level, just to help you keep track of who's doing what, um, especially because if you have new families or new leaders, things like that, they'll ask you, what about Joe Smith and his dog Coco? Where do they go in? And you can be at an absolute loss because you're like, well, I haven't really thought that hard because as agents and coordinators, we always have like a bazillion things to do and it can be hard right at that moment to um, just know exactly where that youth belongs because dog is such a uh, kind of a complex project. So that's why the spreadsheet really helps with that. So you have that. It's a good resource to use. And even if there was, um, like if you left that county and someone else stepped into your position, they could easily look at that spreadsheet, know where the youth have been in the past, and it's an easy transition instead of trying to make something from scratch. Um, so we will have this template available to you. We also highly, highly recommend that um, the spreadsheet kind of stays as a master copy in the extension office, but then you take it to your dog leaders um, and have them help you make sure the youth are in the right place, uh, right placings. For example, um, most of you really know Carol, she's been doing this for a very long time. And so now Carol has retired, I'm in her place and um, she's one of our, our dog leaders. So me and Carol have gone over the spreadsheet I don't even know how many times at this point, um, probably like a billion, but we do it so many times so that I know what's going on with you, she knows, and we share it with the rest of our leaders and our trainers so that everyone's on the same page. And we also share it with the youth once it's completed so that they know where they're at and we are looking at trying to make it live, at least here in Pueblo, um, once it's ready to go. So it's just a really nice thing to do and it makes putting things into fair entry, things like that, super easy because you know where they're supposed to go with what dog, you can pull it in, slap it in there, and off you go. It's a pretty nice, easy thing. So before I show the template, I don't know, Brenda, if you have anything else you want to throw in there before we go ahead on that. Well, um, you can add on to the template if you're an Excel Suave type of individual. What I have is a, a little coding in there where it identifies if the class they were in, they received a qualifying score, and it automatically fill, will fill in what they're supposed to go the next year. Um, it's kind of mechanical. It doesn't have the COVID exceptions in there for this year, but at least it'll give you a good um, starting point. And highly recommended to keep track of those qualifying scores, whether it's um, from county or state, because the state actually determines where you're gonna go for showmanship. But maybe at the county level, it determines where you go for obedience and rally um, if you have you know, a fair that determines your qualification. If you go maybe straight to state because you don't have something from, from your county um, and you count on your state to help, um, that's why you probably need two, two sheets of it. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. So thank you, Brenda, for um, the additions there. And so that as everyone can see here on your screen, um, this is the template that you'll be able to use. And as Brenda said, you're more than welcome to tweak this to fit your uh, specific county needs and how you track your scores. Um, so for example, I made myself and Kirsten our little uh, fake youth in this situation. Um, so as you can see here, I, I, my brain does better if I color code everything that you do not have to do that by any means. It's just easier for me, especially if you have youth who have multiple dogs um, with the same youth. It's a lot easier to know that Kirsten here has these two dogs right in the same color, and then I only have the one in the green so that it's your mind instantly can see who's doing what. Um, we often do an updated date because just so that we know the last time this was looked at, the last time these scores were changed, so we know where we're at in the middle of the year. Um, the other thing here is just making sure that you have the, the name and the breed because it helps when we do registrations and stuff like that because you have all this information current. Same with current rally, current obedience, and current showmanship. So these would be the classes they'd be going into for their very first show. Um, so for example, if there was a show this weekend that both myself and Kirsten were going to, the, that person would know in the extension office, okay, they're gonna register for novice A for myself, novice A and B for Kirsten with her two dogs, and so on and so forth with these, uh, with obedience and showmanship. And if there was an agility portion to that show, you would be able to find that information as well. 
Um, these would get updated as they go along. So that's why it would say current so that you know it's not a past placing. It's where they're at currently in that moment. So it's kind of nice to do it that way. Um, the biggest thing you'll want to notice here is on this showmanship part. If you have a youth who has two dogs, for example, in this case, Kirsten has two imaginary dogs, Coco and Trixie, and only one of them can be doing the showmanship with her. So this year she's going to have Coco do showmanship in with intermediate novice because of her age, she's 11, and then um, Trixie, her terrier, is not going to be in that. So that's how you could make sure to kind of track that. Same thing with um, the scores. As Brenda said, she kind of has it a bit more formulated where it kind of already puts it in. Um, it's up to you how you track scores in your county. If you track outside county scores or not, um, it's kind of whatever you would need it to do. So for example, here I showed how, like if I was going to a show, I went to the March 25th show and these are the scores I got in um, the different divisions and then same with Kirsten. And so I would just put the county they went to, their final scores and the date. So for example, if there were two shows in Douglas, I would know which show was which, especially if they were for out of county. So just a nice thing to do. Um, and you can tweak that for however you use your scores in your county. It's often helpful to have the last state fair scores for that youth. Um, and I always put last state fair scores because sometimes your youth take a year off, especially this year. Um, here in Pueblo, we had plenty of youth who competed in 2019 but they decided to not compete in 2020, even though they were eligible. So they took that year off, but then they're planning on competing now in 2021. So you would need to know those 2019 scores for that youth. So you know where they belong for 2021. So that's why it's really important um, to make sure you have the years with, um, with their scores. And that's why it's important to know if they got a qualifying score, in that division and then also their placing because that kind of changes whether they are required to move up or not as we talked about before with those pla placement charts. So remember for the 2020, 2020 youth who participated first through fifth are required to move up but then in a normal year starting from 2021 forward it'll be first through tenth again like it had been in years prior um, when it comes to state fair scores. So just something to keep in mind with that. And then if you like, we did put a little qualifying score key down here that just shows you what it is for showmanship, obedience, and rally as far as moving up. Um, and on that agility flow chart, it shows you as well their qualifying scores and how they would move up to the next level in those two sets as well. So that's kind of what we have. This will be available to you all. And um, it's perfectly usable and flexible to however you need it. We just wanted to give you something so you weren't out there basically re trying to recreate the wheel because um, it's a great useful tool to use if, if it's useful for you in your county. Are there any questions on this for myself or, or Brenda? You know what I would do Beth in, in that color chart and what I, what I did forever was once they got a qualifying score, I would highlight that in a whole different color. So it's it's really easy to just look and say, okay, this kid got a qualifying score at this show, this show, this show, and what their score was. Um, they don't have to do that, but it's just visually easier to find a uh, bright yellow you know, score or a bright orange score, and then you know that they've got that qualifying score. Yeah, um, Carol's absolutely right. I do that a lot. I'm the personal one that she and I have been working on just because it's easier for us to spot that right away. Um, same if we have youth that we're kind of concerned about, we highlight them in a, in a separate color that just is for those concerned youth we have, just to make sure we, we see it right away, it kind of catches your eye. So something like kind of a helpful tip, but not required by any means, and you're more than welcome to tweak this as you need to for your county. So just helpful tips as you go along, just because we know it's a lot to kind of keep track of, especially if you have a big county with a lot of youth and a lot of dogs to kind of keep keep track of. So things like that. Any other questions or comments? I don't know, Brenda, if you have anything else to add before we um, keep going here. Nope, that's good. All right, so with that, we will keep going along here. So our, um, our next key speaker is going to be Dennis, and uh, he has such a a rich background that I'm not even going to try. So Dennis, if you will um, take the floor, then we will have you talk a little bit about dog judges and other tips and tricks that you feel would be really helpful for this group to know. 
Happy to do so. Thank you, Brenda or Beth. Um, I'm Dennis Korash, and I've been involved uh, with dogs and, and breeding and showing since I was about four years old. So I've been doing it a long time um, and really do enjoy uh, my involvement with the AKC uh, over the years, but probably not as much as I enjoy working with the 4-H kids. Um, I've worked with several different clubs and in helping them and have judged uh, states several times and have been on the committee now for a couple of years. Um, I guess the main thing I'd ask you to do is to make sure your judges, since so many of them come from AKC or AK, have AKC background, they understand that um, 4-H is not AKC. There are some distinct differences. The showmanship classes are judged solely on the ability of the skills of the juniors in handling their dogs. Therefore, the purpose of showmanship competition is twofold. Um, to encourage juniors to participate in the sport of dogs and to provide juniors with meaningful competition um, so they can learn, practice, and improve in the areas ha of handling and sportsmanship. It's really truly a partnership between them and their dogs. Um, remind the judges that it, it's okay to have conversations with the youth and not be so harsh. Um, even at the state level, I try to gather all of the kids after the, the particular um, ring is over and talk to them about what I thought they did well, what they didn't, sometimes individually, sometimes just kind of as a group, so that they always leave with some things that they know they did really well with and at least one thing to work on. Um, and that's even on my master's, I try to do that. Um, Judges should anticipate that uh, that these uh, these kids, these 4-Hers, have bait, brushes, comb, water buckets, ice, etc., where applicable. In other words, um, it's okay to have the use bait in the ring or not use bait in the ring. It's really up to the junior, and they shouldn't be penalized for it, and they shouldn't be rewarded for it. Um, but the uh, if they are using bait and the underuse of that or the too much use of that um, can be penalized. Uh, grooming their dog is also important. We need to understand that uh, they need to groom if they have a uh, uh, AKC recognized dog towards that, that the way the dog should be groomed. Um, and if it's a mixed breed dog, they need to groom towards what that dog is most like. Um, and it's, it's in association with the head of the breed. They're not penalized for not, uh, for not having a good quality of groom, but rather that there was an effort made towards that groom. Um, juniors also need to, uh, are expected to show their mouths um, and this is one area that gets very confusing because uh, especially if you have kids coming from AKC competitions, they know if they need to show their bite or the bite and their teeth and their mouth. So, so really these guys should be showing what's appropriate for their breed. But so often the judges don't always know and neither do the kids. So what I try to come, tell my kids is show the bite and the teeth. Um, and uh, if the judge asks for anything more, be prepared to do that. Uh, yeah, that's the difference talk. between. Um, showing the bite is really just the front of the, the mouth. So you li lift the, the front teeth and, or front lips and, and show the, the bite uh, right in front. Certain breeds only have the bite. Other breeds, you need to show all of the teeth, which includes the bite. This and so, both sides of their mouth. Um, and the mouth then is, is the same thing. You show the front, the side teeth, and, and then you open the mouth and that's where the difference is. And that's, uh, that really comes out of AKC where there are some breeds that, that are tooth fairy breeds. In other words, the judges really have to look to see if they have missing teeth. 
which isn't as important in juniors, but they still should know that they need to do that. Um, lastly, uh, um, patterns and courtesy turns. Judges need to understand that there are only certain patterns these kids are expected to know. And um, courtesy turns should be used, but I wouldn't penalize kids heavily against them. Courtesy turns is not courtesy to the judge. What it really is, the real motivation behind a courtesy turn is by the time the dog is up to where the judge is, they're at the speed they're going around the ring at. Most juniors don't understand that. So some of the judges will try to penalize kids if they're not doing a courtesy turn right next to the judge. And that's not actually correct. They should be doing it kind of behind the judge and then hit their speed as they're moving forward. Um, it's not a tight turn, it's more of a wide turn to get your dog moving correctly. Um, that's kind of the, the, the biggest thing. Handler appearance is important. They need to, to, to look, uh, look good and be appropriate for the ring. And it just depends on the level of competition. Um, the judge, I forgot one thing on bait, the judge also can opt not to allow bait in the ring. That is up to the judge. Are there some questions I could answer? Well, the one thing, Dennis, I was gonna add to that is if you, if you think you're gonna hire somebody that shows AKC, be sure to check uh, that there's not shows in your area uh, that the judges all may be going to for their own competition. And uh, in fact, I think Dennis, there's a show in Greeley on our date for State Fair. There I'm is. not sure, but that's what, yeah. And so we might have a hard time finding some judges for that. But that's one thing to kind of check with if you have some AKC people in your community or, or that you know show AKC, check and see if there's any major shows. Maybe not try to, to put your show on that weekend. Uh, if you can't help it, well, that's just how it is. And when Dennis is referring to juniors, that means all our 4 H kids. All that doesn't mean the yeah, I'm sorry. Division. Old habits. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> you're you're interred to that. <laughs> Can I add one thing um, in particular about obedience judges? Um, I know we've had this experience, but if you hire a judge who is experienced in AKC obedience. 4-H obedience is just a little different. Our um, beginner novice A class does not have a parallel in AKC. So just make sure your, your obedience judge is familiar with that 4-H um, level um, when they judge. It's, it's a little different than what they're used to with AKC. And one of the, one of the things I would suggest when, when you hire a judge, Dennis knows all about showmanship. So we wouldn't do this with him. But if you hire somebody that is AKC, never judged 4-H, be sure to send them the, the copy of that division's rules. And the most important thing, send them a score sheet ahead of time so that they can study that, that score sheet and know, you know what the difference is, how 4-H is done. For example, in some AKC classes, if they, they do something, uh, they're excused from the ring right away. Well, 4-H doesn't always do that. And at the bottom of that score sheet, any score sheet, especially obedience, is what can what they can be uh, excused from the ring for. So uh, that score sheet is very important when you're hiring judges for them to look at. Would you agree, Dennis? Yes, absolutely. In in showmanship, really the only thing there that uh, you could be excused for, and that's dog aggressiveness, either towards other dogs or towards the judge or other people in the ring. Excellent point. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Any questions? Okay. 
Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dennis. Um, we really appreciate you being able to be here on the call along with all of our other um, key speakers for today. And of course, anyone, if you come up with questions later on after this orientation, things like that, that you feel like Dennis would be a great person to ask or Carol or any of those, um, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Kirsten, just because we do respect the privacy of our volunteers. And so we'll, we'll funnel your questions to them um, just because they they're busy individuals as well. So thank you so much. And we will continue on here with our presentation. So our very next session is about um, volunteers. And this talks about like the state fair uh, show specifically and the volunteers that we use during that time. Um, and Anne is our volunteer uh, coordinator superintendent. So I will give the floor to her and she can chat with you all about that and kind of give you some reminders to think about now as we start to head towards August. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them to her directly as well. Great, thanks. Um, so to put on a successful state fair dog trials here, we really do need quite a few volunteers. And, um, you know, the categories of volunteers really um, tend to focus around ring management um, and then also some administrative um, volunteers that we help. So in order to run the fair, we need three ring stewards for each ring. And this is where we really, really need the help of, um, of folks uh, from the counties. At each, at each ring, we have usually three volunteers. We have um, a volunteer who we call the table steward. And that's the person that's um, usually most experienced and we'll work directly with the judges, um, keeping the score sheets lined up, double checking numbers, um, do, you know, managing the paperwork at the table for the judge. That's, that's really the most important job. Um, and I will usually look for a volunteer who has that kind of experience, um, perhaps not a parent, maybe somebody that's um, you know, just uh, been an experienced um, uh, ring steward before, or perhaps a 4-H uh, alumni that, that knows what's going on. The other two volunteers at the ring can really be anyone. They don't really need to have any specialized training. Um, one of the jobs is a gate steward. And, and if you've been to State Fair before, there's, um, there's a poster that's ringside that's got the armband numbers on it. It's the go board. It has the, the order of you know, which dog handler team comes up next in the ring. And so the one job of the gate steward is to manage um, who's on deck, who's going in, you know, always having uh, um, someone ready to go in for the judge so that the ring continues to flow smoothly. The third volunteer there is um, kind of a jack of all trades. Again, no experience really needed at all. It's, it's kind of a kid wrangler, making sure you've got two or three kids down the line kind of ready to be, to go and making sure they've got their equipment, they don't have their dog treats, you know, if there's no treats in the ring, um, perhaps adjusting jump heights in between classes, um, so again, really not any experience needed that the judge will um, train each of these volunteers at the room and tell them how, you know, that particular judge likes things done. Um, so, but, you know, overall, we need on Saturday, we will have seven rings running and we need three volunteers at each ring. So we need 21 volunteers for Saturday just to operate the rings. And on Sunday, we run five rings. And so we need at least 15 volunteers just for the rings on Sunday. In addition to our ring stewards, we also need volunteers to help us set up um, the show. And that involves laying out the mats, taping down the mats, setting up the ring gates, setting up the tables, putting the equipment at the, at the appropriate rings. It takes a couple hours to do that. And this year, um, they will be having an event in the venue on Friday night. So we will need to get there early on Saturday morning to do our setup. And it, like I said, it does take a couple hours. So we would love to have some folks there, you know, right before six in the morning. Um, I know this probably unfairly burdens people that are either staying in local hotels or um, from counties that are right down there. But, you know, we really need to get things set up so that we can get the, the judging started promptly. Um, I think we're scheduled to start, is at 9 or 9.30 on Saturday morning? So um, many hands will make light the work. The, the mats are about 35 pounds, 40 pounds a piece. Um, so we need people to carry the mats out, to roll them out. Um, youth members are really good at being down on their knees and taping. So if you've got some kids that need 
you know, some service work, they're always really helpful in the morning there to, to get things set up. Um, and then throughout the state fair, um, the two days, we will need some help for just various administrative um, duties. We may need a couple people to help with the registration table. We may need some people to help write ribbons out, um, you know, just other kind of things like that. When fair is over on Sunday, we will be cleaning up and we usually have plenty of people in the in the arena there that, that are willing to help. So um, I will ask probably for a couple people to just to be set up, I mean, uh, take down crew leads. But other than that, we usually have plenty of volunteers for that. So um, we would ask each of the counties, if they can, to try to get at least one or two volunteers to sign up on the Google spreadsheet in August so that, you know, so that we can start the judging promptly and, and get things going. Um, it, it's worked out really well in the past with the advanced sign up. We usually have gotten quite a few people to, to volunteer that day, but then day of, you know, we're usually asking for a few, few more people to help out. So um, if you could just remind your, your dog project members that are going down to state that we would love to have a couple volunteers from each county. And, you know, I find that it's pretty easy, especially if you've got both parents coming down um, to state fair, you know, maybe the mom's down ringside or trying to help the kid get set up and the dad is just sitting there. Gosh, we would love him, you know, to come help, you know, be one of the gate attendants or a kid wrangler, um, you know, setting jumps or moving signs around in the rally ring. Um, just give them something to do. <laughs> so um, anyway, if you could just mention to your families that we will need to have um, one or two volunteers from every county um, for the youth that are coming to, to State Fair, that would be a huge help and it'll just help us be able to run more efficiency and on time. Um, and then Kirsten, you said we are going to have a Google sign up this year. Um, so there'll be a link that goes out probably around when you're signing up your kids for State Fair um, yeah. to go ahead and enter in the information um, for the volunteer stuff. And I will be putting together some job descriptions so people aren't as intimidated. I think uh, the reaction I've gotten in the past has always been like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to ring steward. I don't know anything there, but it's actually a very easy job. And I think very rewarding as well. You learn a lot down there. Um, and uh, I, I think it's kind of fun myself. So um, anyway, nothing to be intimidated about. I think that's it for volunteers. Anybody have any questions um, or did I miss anything? Okay. All right, if there's no questions, then we will keep keep trucking on. Thanks so much, Anne, uh, for that information. Of course, as we get closer to that, um, you can always reach out to Anne directly because she's she's been doing the volunteer coordination for so long. She's definitely the go-to person. Um, so please take note of her email down there. Um, it will be made more available as we get a little closer to all questions about volunteer, volunteer situations. Anne is a, is a great reference for that. Um, so just some, some good information there. So with that, um, we kind of have our very last slide here. Uh, just uh, if you have any questions throughout our 4-H year, things like that before State Fair, you can always reach out to either myself or Kirsten. Our emails are listed there. If you're interested in being on the State Dog Committee, we're always welcome uh, new people, whether it be like a, if you have a county dog leader, we, we have room for those. If you're an agent or a coordinator and you'd like to be involved, um, we're happy to help you because we have a lot of big things in the works still. Um, we've just we've just been doing so much and we cannot uh, appreciate the state committee enough with everything they do and how much time they've all spent on these resources that we've made for you all. Um, and I know Kirsten, I think you had a couple other things you were gonna share with the group. So unless there's questions, I will hand it over to you. And uh, I think that'll be it for the day. I think the last thing I had is I have some examples of like class progression if anyone wants to hang out and go through those we don't have to go into it right now um, and I'll also be emailing those out so you can kind of see how to use the charts and then Anne did remind me that um, animal IDs for dog is due May 1st so work with your members on getting that updated and the more correct information we have in 4-H online the easier it'll be for us when we get to state fair stuff so we do appreciate agents or leaders or office admins taking some time to make sure information's correct. Um, Douglas County, I closed our dog stuff April 1st, so we're now combing through and doing cleanup on that in our county. 
Um, so just thank you. It helps us when things are correct. So we appreciate the work you guys put into that. And let us know if you have any questions on the dog IDs, because as we've been getting in, unique questions have been popping up that Beth and I don't know the answer to. So we holler up the ladder or ask those in our committee for expert advice on that. So always ask questions if you have it. We're here, we're not experts, but we know how to find them. This is Brenda, I have one thing um, for those individuals that uh, are trying not to have any of the height blank, um, especially for when we're trying to schedule for the rally and the obedience ring. That just takes up more time on the floor with the judge. So we're gonna try to actually do the scheduling before the day actually occurs. So try to make sure those uh, heights are actually entered in. That'd be helpful, thanks. And if you have any dogs that um, are not current on shot uh, by that May 1st or whatever your deadline in your county is, um, and let's say the dog is current right now, but by the time your county fair or state fair comes, uh, be sure to update the extension office and the agent or the coordinator on the new date um, that that dog has its, has its new shot. Does anybody have questions on what shots are recommended? Carol, do you want to touch on the shots regarding like titers and things like that? Because I know, um, especially as we get closer, sometimes that's always a question that comes up that I know um, had been floated around in the past as well. So I don't know if you just want to chat about that for our last little few moments we have here with everyone. Yeah, titers are not accepted in 4-H. Um, just for the, the reason that they're very expensive. If you have a titer dog, this, um, they have to have a specific test from a specific place uh, to get that. We just, we don't allow titers. Um, Bordetella is iffy because there's so many different Bordetella shots that a dog can get. Um, I don't know, did, I don't know that we made that. They have to be up to date on their rabies. They have to be up to date on distemper. And there used to be uh, the DHLPP. Well, the DH, the L they took out, uh, leptospirosis. Some vets don't give leptospirosis, some vets do. So I think it's, you just talk to your vet and, uh, and see what they recommend. But the two we need from state fair are rabies and that has to be administered by a, a licensed veterinarian. You can't order it yourself and do your own shot. Now you can distemper uh, or you know whatever else they give their dogs, uh, that would be fine. But rabies has to be administered by a registered veterinarian. Perfect, thank you, Carol. Because I know a um, couple couple counties have had questions about that and everything. So as you can see here, Kirsten started sharing her screen. That's just that little front part on the dog trial rules. That is from um, the state vet that we work with, with Reagan Adams. And as you can see there in the yellow, it does say Bordetella is strongly encouraged, but it's not required. So if you get questions from your youth about all that, um, it's pretty easy right then and there. And, and again, it just helps so that if they come to the show and we can see that, you know, they're, they're missing some of the most important vaccinations, it's right there in the rules. So everyone has a chance to see that um, before they get too far ahead in the year with their dogs and 4-H. And so that's kind of it. Um, any questions or anything like that on here, whether it be vaccinations or the show or anything else you saw today? All right, well, hearing none, um, Kirsten, it's up to you. If you would like to go through those questions with a few people who would like to stay on here. Um, those, as she did mention, those will be sent out to you. So um, don't feel if you are pressured for time, you know, um, we don't want to make anyone stay on here to go over time, uh, but it's, we, we'd like to just show you that briefly. Of course, this is being recorded. So if you wanna just 
uh, log off now and, and check back in on the recorded session to catch those through that, you definitely can. Um, but if you log off now, we thank you so much for joining us. Um, think of all of our key speakers that took the time to be on here with us today. And uh, with that, we'll, I'll give it over to Kirsten and thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely. And if everyone logs off, go have a happy Friday, guys. I'm excited for the nice weather we have this weekend. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Carol. Good to hear you. My mom says hello. Oh, is she there with you? Yes. She wasn't listening to you, but she knew that, yeah, she knew that you would be on. So <laughs> yeah, thanks everybody. Take care. Bye guys.